I want to know, can anyone relate to this? <laughs> Is anyone else's brain feeling foggy? You're forgetting things like forgetting words. Like, oh, what is that word? What is that word? Are you losing your train of thought? Mid-sentence, you're like, oh, wait, what was, what was my point? <laughs> Feeling confused, like, what am, I, what am I doing next? Where am I going? What am... It was struggling to make decisions. Like, I keep looking for this, you know, decision-making fatigue as a thing because I think it's a thing. I haven't seen it called that, but I think it's a thing. I did read some research the other day that that looked at the details, like like having to pay so much attention to details during this pandemic, that that really is fueling some fatigue, some some stress, some anxiety, because we're having to be much more attentive to details for a much longer period of time than we have in the past. Anybody making mistakes? You are not alone. Bethany, I see the chat lighting up. What are you seeing? A lot of yeses that are <laughs> capitalized. Um, it's someone said it's like Groundhog Day every day. And that really <laughs> hits my heart because that's one of my favorite movies. And it's also so real. Um, and people are also saying, oh my gosh, thank goodness this community is chiming in because they thought it was just them. So it's a relevant and good thing you're talking about, Crystal. Great. Thank you so much. Let me just be honest. A couple of days ago, um, I knew I was supposed to pick my husband up at Hertz rental car. He was dropping off a rental car, Hertz rental car. No worries. I even plugged it into my GPS. So I knew which one was Hertz rental car on West Broad Street in, in, in Richmond, right? Because there's multiple car rental places, but Hertz, Hertz. So I had the kids in the car. I plugged it into GPS to make sure I got the fastest route. And lo and behold, I'm sitting there like, I'm really surprised that I, I beat him here. I thought he was going to be here before I got here, but okay. So I sit there for a couple minutes and I pick up the phone to get ready to call him. And, and as I do, it finally pops into my head. I'm not even at Hertz. I'm at budget. Like, why did I pull into budget? I had Hertz even in my GPS. So I'm like, okay, this brain fog thing is real. This is so real. So anyway, yeah, you are not alone if you are in that space. But here's what the experts are telling us, okay? It's real, this mental fog that many of us are experiencing is real. And it's, it's not abnormal to think that that's gonna happen and show up in our lives because it's been a really abnormal year. The stress, the trauma, some people are referring to it as the collective stress or the collective trauma that we've all been exposed to, some to greater degrees than others, but there is this collective nature of the stress, this ongoing sort of it's always lingering over us. And, and even when we're not consciously thinking about it, impacting the decisions that we're making. So that's a normal response, right, to where we've been. And how does it show up? We might feel exhausted or irritable. I don't want to admit to that, but that's true. Sometimes that irritability comes out. <laughs> the fogginess, they're all normal. Now, what the experts are also saying in this space is that most of us are resilient. If you're on this series with us, often you, you hear that word come up over and over and over again about resiliency. Most of us are resilient. And so you know, the, the light at the end of the tunnel for this is that most of us will be able to, you know, see ourselves past this fatigue, past this brain fog, when things start to open up, when there's some, you know, normalcy, if you will, whatever that is, but when we're able to resume some of that. Now, some of us, you know, may need additional supports and, and we'll have greater impacts that, that won't just sort of resolve with some good self-care, there may be some needed supports, there will be some needed supports um, and interventions in the professional space and arena. But for, for most of us, we'll be resilient and, and be able to sort of, sort of come out of some of this. But for now, here's where the research is telling us we are. We're a stressed bunch of people. We've got some stressors going on and here's how it's showing up. So there's an ongoing survey. This, this one is from APA, the American Psychological Association, looking at um, stress in America. So there's a series, there's a, there's a survey that happens on a 
pretty regular interval to say, where are we with our stress? And here is some, some pieces that I wanted to pull out and, and share. Looking at parents, those who have parental responsibilities, so primary caregiver responsibilities um, for kids. 75% of parents say they could have used more emotional support than what they got, which means there's a deficit there, just the emotional support. Just about a third of parents say that they have received treatment from a mental health professional since the start of the pandemic. So one out of three. Um, and just about a quarter, so almost one out of four, and we're talking about parents, were diagnosed with a mental health disorder since the start of the pandemic. So we're talking about just about a year ago. Those are some pretty startling numbers to look at. Um, and so we should have some awareness about that. There are some different struggles out there. And then if you look over at the chart on the side, there's some of the pieces of information that are teased apart based on how uh, mothers are experiencing things relative to fathers experiencing things and, and where they show up. So you see the, the um, that bluish color, the light bluish color, I think it's light bluish, it looks like that on my screen, is representative of where, where mothers responded, the greenish is where fathers responded. So mothers more likely than fathers to say that their mental health worsened compared to before the pandemic, right? But father is more likely to report both behavioral and physical changes. So one of those is sleep. So the percentage of um, people reporting that they slept either more or less than they wanted to, really high for both, but you see um, 77%, so three quarters of the moms, 87% of the fathers. Then you look at um, weight changes, right? So unwanted weight changes, whether it's weight loss that's unwanted or weight gain that's unwanted. And you see there, you know, just about two thirds of the moms reported that that was true for them. Since all this is since the start of the pandemic, 80% of the fathers. And then when we start thinking about how are people, how are people trying to cope with the stress? One of the other distinctions that you saw there was the percentage of parents reporting that they were consuming more alcohol to cope with stress. So 29% of the mothers, almost half, 48% of the fathers. So we're gonna dig a little bit deeper into some of these, but, but one that we wanna call out because that fatigue is lingering and there are many different things that contribute to fatigue. But one of them is about sleep and rest. And you see that we're struggling in that arena. So Don, I'm going to come to you because a couple of sessions ago, you did a whole, whole Balance in Life segment on the importance of rest and sleep. Can you talk to us about why it's so important? Absolutely. Thank you so much. And good morning, everybody. I see in the chat, people are having like these weird dreams and, and sleep is so important. And one of the, some of the things, the top six things or, or things that uh, happen when your body loses sleep, one of the things is that you can get sick. Um, because when you think about what happens when you sleep, you are supposed to be resting. And during that resting time, your body is rejuvenating, regenerating. It's, it's, it's taking the time to kind of equal it. I always have a problem with it. Equalize everything that's going on. Um, and when you're not getting good sleep, then that means that the things that need to happen are not happening. And so you wake up kind of in a deficit almost. You have not uh, been a, your body has not been able to rejuvenate. And so, yeah, one of the things that can happen when you're not getting enough sleep is you're more prone to sickness. And then you, can think, you can't think and you forget stuff. That brain fog is because some of it is you're tired, right? I mean, if you're not getting enough rest, you can caffeinate all day long and you can do everything you need to do to be wide awake. But at some point your body says, I'm tired and I'm awake. 
but I'm so tired, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so you have to remember that rest is crucial. And I, I and believe me, y'all, I am saying this, but I can speak to this because just the other day I had a report due. And so I took, um, I like the yerba mate tea because it's a natural caffeine and it keeps me awake. But at some point I was awake and unproductive. And you know, when you're trying to be productive and you're tired and you can't think straight, it makes no sense to just keep pushing. At some point, you have to give your body what it's asking for. Um, and that's some rest, laying down, closing your eyes, whether it's you going into a deep, deep sleep or at least just putting yourself in a peaceful, calm state so that your body can rest and your mind can slow down and rest. Another thing that happens when you, when you lose sleep or don't get enough sleep is you gain weight. And you might think, well, why am I gaining weight? Well, some of it is because you're staying up more, right? If you're awake, moving around and not getting enough sleep, what are you doing? You're snacking possibly. Maybe you've got the munchies. Maybe you've got some nervous energy. Maybe you're just bored and you need a distraction. And so what you do is that you go get something to eat. Well, that's additional calories. That's the, the fast food that you don't necessarily need, that high calorie snack that is maybe is soothing, but not necessarily good for you. Um, and then, like I said, if you go back to what I was saying at first, your body uses that rest time to regenerate and to, uh, to level set. And if you're not given it that time, then it can't do what it needs to do. And so your metabolism can slow down. And again, you're gaining weight. Not getting enough sleep could reduce your sex drive. I don't know if that is speaking to anybody, but understand it is real. And, and research has shown that not getting enough sleep makes you tired. And yes, it, it can reduce your sleep drive or your sex drive. You are more accident prone. According to the National Sleep Foundation, people are three times more likely to be involved in a car accident if they get six or fewer hours of sleep each night. And so what that's saying is that, you know, drunk driving is real, but distracted driving because of tiredness is real too. And if you are tired, you're more easily distracted. And when you're on a road late at night and you probably should be asleep, then, you know, that that's another way you can get in an accident or just not paying attention. You know, you're walking straight and you potentially bump into something where if you're behind the wheel of a car and you're not necessarily paying attention, then you're bumping into the car in front of you because you're distracted, you know, or you think the light is about to turn green and you know you're in, in, your, you're in your text messages and it's like, <gasps> did I miss it? And an accident happened. So you really have to make sure that you're getting rest so that you can function because brain fog affects you whether you're in your home or in your car or taking your morning walk. And then ladies and gentlemen who are concerned, your skin suffers, it causes wrinkles. Research has shown that losing sleep causes wrinkles. So if you, you're concerned about those looks and you're drinking more water, but you're not getting enough sleep, you might want to consider getting some rest so that your beauty regimen is enhanced and is actually successful. Thank you so much, Dawn. I've seen a lot of good things happening in the chat. Um, when we send out this presentation, we will send out the whole presentation in case you missed it um, that Dawn shared with us. It has the sleep recommendations. It's broken out by age group and lots of different um, pieces of information in there. So we'll send that slide deck and that um, presentation as well because it keeps coming up over and over and over again. I also saw posted in the chat, uh, Susan posted that a lot of people in the office are having accidents falling at home, having um, sprains and strains and things like that. So certainly seeing those things um, show up as well. Um, Don's earlier presentation also has some strategies for helping to get um, both the quality and quantity of sleep that, that we need. All right, has anyone gained or lost weight that you didn't want to lose or gain? Anyone had some of this you know, undesired weight change? There is a healthy weight. Some people will say, oh no, let me lose that weight, but that there's a point where you can be underweight and that's also a health risk, right? So I see that chat lighting up. Let me show, tell you a lot of people, as I mentioned in that previous statistic, have been experiencing that. And so when the researchers broke down the survey, 
Um, they've, they've identified, you know, different, um, you know, identity groups, if you will, or categories where people have really been experiencing, you know, some of this unexpected. So, um, you know, U.S. adults as a whole, there's, you know, 18% who had an undesired weight loss with an average weight loss. Remember, this is undesired of 26 pounds. Um, and then 42% with undesired weight gain, right? People have called it that pandemic weight gain. Um, 29 pounds on average, um, U.S. adults have gained un undesired weight gain um, during COVID. So that, that's a lot. And you can look through, you'll get this slide deck, so you can go through a little bit deeper, but um, it's really interesting to look at where some of these things have shown up. If you scroll down a little bit um, and look at parents, if you look at where parents are, there's um, an average 36 pound weight gain, 51%. So thinking about how things tie together, um, they really also pulled out essential workers, people who are identified as essential workers. Um, and then generation wise, right, which are also probably some of the parents, but um, those that are in the age category of 25 to you know, 42, that millennial age, the highest um, unwanted weight gain. So just thinking about where that is, it, it's showing up. We have, have had sessions on the, the food, the nutrition, the, the physical activity and those pieces, but even the rest, I mean, Don just talked about not getting enough sleep and how that contributes to, or can contribute to weight gain. So at least on one side. So all these factors, you know, really sort of um, play off of one another. And when certain things are out of whack, it can really impact other parts of our, our lives. So people are stressed and concerned and uneasy about the future. I was um, reading some things this morning about um, the uneasiness that people are um, experiencing and the real stress and anxiety that some people are experiencing around things reopening, right? So as we start to move to a place where uh, we just, you know, heard yesterday, CDC recommended that fully vaccinated um, individuals, you know, um, can take off the mask, so to speak. And, and those prompts and changes are, are really um, causing some additional levels of stress and anxiety for some people. Um, so this, when this survey was, and this is the March survey, you talked about, you know, people who don't feel comfortable going back to living life like it was before the pandemic, um, and how many people said that they agreed or, or um, strongly or somewhat agreed with that. So there's a lot of people that don't feel comfortable going back to what was um, the routine. And then on the other side, I feel uneasy about adjusting to in-person interaction once the pandemic ends. There's a lot of people that still feel really uncomfortable with that. And those are other um, sources and places where people are experiencing varying levels of stress. And then all of this, um, this, this past year, so many of us have put off parts of our physical health, right? Many of us, self-included, have not gone for some of, you know, maybe an annual or um, biannual appointment, right? It took me a while. Like I, I skipped my six month dentist appointment if I'm telling the truth. Um, I did go to the dentist, but I skipped the six months. So it ended up being 12 months from my you know, regular appointment. But a lot of people have done similarly. 47%, almost half of Americans have delayed or canceled healthcare services. And then more than half have been less physically active than they have wanted to be. So there's lots of things happening going on. And when you think about all of these things, you can see how they show up in lots of different places and how if you feel fatigued, you're not gonna feel like you know, being physically active, but we also know being physically active helps generate some energy. So these things really do you know, play off of one another. And so um, I'm gonna hand things over to Herman. Herman, do you have um, a video queued up for us? No, I don't. I didn't know which one you wanted. If you want to do the um, Hello Giggles. Yes. The what? Hello Giggles. Okay, wait a minute. You sent it to me in an email? 
I did, and I chatted you, but that's okay. You tell me when it's ready, and I'll. I'll... Okay, I'm coming with it. It won't take so long. It won't take Herman, long. Herman is quick. Bethany, what's happening in the chat? I'm trying to keep up, but it's busy. So, so <laughs> a, a lot of people are um, really feeling um, that anxiety around, even though the pandemic is ending, which should be a good thing, or you know, the vaccination is here and that should be a good thing. And the recent news of the CDC lifting some of those mask mandates, but there's still quite a bit of anxiety and coming out because we've been so ingrained and used to that. So, and people are talking about some of the critical things be, beyond just the weight gain, but actual overall healthcare, dentist appointments, doctors, and things like that, that they've neglected or overlooked because they're scared to go to those appointments unless it was an emergency. And so feeling like our overall wellness um, has, has taken a little bit of a dive and that would include your mental health too, right? So it all kind of is, is tied into one thing. And so hopefully we're turning a corner though and people are gonna start feeling more comfortable about getting out there. And so some people are also commenting that they are wrapping their brains around, okay, it's, it's, it's getting better and we can get out to our appointments now and we can start taking steps towards better wellness. So that's good to see. But yeah, I think we can all relate to skipping. A lot of people are probably happy to skip the dentist, right? This is a good excuse, but if you've got a tooth problem, go get it taken care of. <laughs> for sure, for sure. I didn't want to skip beyond that. I'm, I'm not at an age where I need to keep skipping dentist appointments, but it was uneasy. It definitely, you know, felt uncomfortable, but all is well. It was a few months ago. We're good. Yes. That, but it did bring, it, it elicited some anxiety, you know, some, some real stress and anxiety for me, but we did it. Here we go. starting to be talked about and recognized even more um, this brain fog that has come on just as a result of us being in this ongoing stressful state. Um, one of the pieces, you know, we, we talked about like, what do you do for your own self-care? And we talked a lot about um, self-care and those things are really important and we'll bring those up. However, um, I heard this expression and it resonated with me that, you know, sometimes the self-care, you're so depleted that the, the usual things you've done for self-care aren't enough to fill you up. So you may have to do a little bit extra. And I, and I was reading where someone said they hit their pandemic wall. Like they have been trying to do well, trying to keep up with routines, trying to do things that were good and helpful and usually would replenish and they hit a pandemic wall. And those things were no longer replenishing and no longer filling up the things that um, you know you would be there. And so the suggestions were, for example, if one of your things was you enjoyed taking long walks, right? So maybe you you revisit, you go take the long walk, but if it's still not replenishing, maybe it's time to try something different. So maybe try a bike ride rather than the, the long walk, just to you know share you know shift up a few of the things, just to see if you can push past a little bit more, um, you know, past that hurdle. So all of those things are really important for, for keeping us going and then knowing what those things are. So here's a question. What are the things you're doing to cope with the stress right now? So as you drop those in chat, I'm gonna tell you what some people um, shared in another survey that um, 
was identified. And these are the most common things people are doing to deal with stress this year. Listen to music was the most popular thing that people said they were doing is listening to music. Um, I don't know if this is age. I don't know if it's the time and space, but my 12 year old has just, I don't know, quadrupled the amount of time she spends listening to music lately. She's just, she has music on constantly. She's, she's always liked music, but it has just really skyrocketed. So exercising, surfing the net, that's something I, I do. Sometimes I do it too much and I need to go to sleep, but um, binge watching, that's what I'll call it, watching TV or movies for more than two hours a day, spending time with family and friends, uh, reading, praying, napping. There you go, Don. you give us the license for the nap. Um, some are eating. <laughs> and some spending time doing a hobby. These were the most common responses um, that people shared. So we have a set of, of you know, things that we can put in place to help us with mitigating stress. And Alan Rasmussen has shared um, some pieces around you know, what we can do. So we know these things, habits and good sleep and eating well and moving and Practicing things like mindfulness, meditation, yoga, prayer would fall into that. Staying connected with other people is really important and avoiding isolation. Also avoiding self-medication. So we saw that, you know, drinking more alcohol piece in there. We also know um, what we've been seeing with the use of other um, drugs, um, you know, overdoses and things like that have been on the rise. Shut off news, <laughs> that would include social media or you know, those things, if they're increasing your anxiety, just, just shut it off. Um, give yourself time to relax and what that means for you and be gracious to yourself. Don't compare yourself to other people or compare yourself even to yourself at a non-pandemic time. Be gracious with yourself. Thinking about how your emotions can spiral May, may help us pause in a moment to not go down that path, if you will, um, and spend time thinking about your own coping skills, controlling what you can control and not focusing and dwelling on the things you can't. And then by all means, reaching out for community supports and programs and professional help or support if needed. So Don, one of the, um, as we start to wrap, I have something for you and something I want Bethany to lift up as well. You did a previous session asking us how well we know ourselves. And so will you talk us through this, um, you know, what this is and people will get it in their emails. Absolutely. Thank you. So, you know, we go through life focusing so much on other things and other people, but at some point we need to know ourselves and we need to know ourselves well enough to know how to pivot um, and when things just don't seem to work, we need to be able to identify where that comes from or what happens or just how do we change, right? If somebody upsets you to the point where you can't think straight, if you don't know what you need to do, then it's harder to shift out of that negative space. So these nine questions are just uh, uh, some, some pivotal questions to help you to a truly get to know yourself. And if you can instantaneously answer these questions, then that's awesome. If you cannot, then I encourage you to really take time and figure out, you know, when you are sad, what brings you joy? When you're disappointed, what brings you joy? And, and what negatively triggers you? Because if you know what triggers you, when you see it start, then you can immediately navigate away from it. Because if you don't know what negatively triggers you, then you're being triggered constantly. And it's like you, you get into a negative place and space unnecessarily, right? And what is your physical response to stress? Sometimes stress is your body is saying, hello, hello, please stop. I'm stressed, I don't like this, I'm, I'm unhappy, I'm uncomfortable. And you don't realize that it's your body telling you that. And so you press forward as opposed to listening to your body and instantaneously saying, wait, this is not a good situation. This is not a good interaction. Maybe, you know, you go and, and nibble. I realized that my youngest daughter was an emotional eater. And so I was wondering what's going on, why is she consuming so much? Well, she was an emotional eater. And so as soon as I recognize that in her, I can help her learn to pay attention to that and navigate away from it. 
Um, and then lastly, because I know we're short on time, what is your favorite hobby that does not cost any money? This is something that I encourage you, if you don't know or you don't have identified, then take time to learn this. Because someone you have stress, sometimes you just need to take a moment and do something that you enjoy. And if you know what it is and it doesn't cost money, you can have it ready to go whenever. Because we have to focus so much more on self-care during these pandemic times. And I hope that that's something that everybody continues after the pandemic. Because even when the pandemic ends, we are still gonna have lives that are filled with challenges and disappointments and stress. And understanding yourself will help you pivot to a better place for you as you navigate through these challenges. Yeah. I really appreciate that, Dawn, because um, the, the research and, and it will also support that if you came in, you know, fairly resilient with some of these things in place, you are faring better mm -hmm. than those who came in already at a deficit. And so to your point on the other end, right, you're gonna be more resilient and, and able to come out of this if, if you had some things in place, but you keep them in place. So the next stressor, the next thing that comes along, you, you have some things in place already. You're not going in at a deficit. So you, you have something so that as things get depleted, you're not fully depleted as quickly. So I appreciate that um, because it's not just pandemic related, right? Right, especially, especially the, the identifying when you're hungry. You know, right. if you right. don't know when you're hungry and you're one of those people who's determined to get it done, then you're going to push through and then you're starving and then you overeat or you grab the worst thing that's closest to right. you. <laughs> and then that contributes to the weight gain. For sure, it all does. And then your body processes and holds onto food differently too, based on the timing of when it gets it. So um, I have a final quote and then I have something I would like for Bethany to share out too. And NPR had done um, a, a, a series, of, of, it's a two part um, on this issue, right? The exhaustion and the brain fog and the fatigue. And I thought this quote was really um, useful for this space. Um, and it's by um, Dr. Gold, who was quoted in the articles, said, I, she said, I think that because so many people are struggling with this and because it's so normal, everybody has something to say. If we could just get to the point where we could be talking about the stuff more openly, we would feel a lot less alone. And I feel like that this space and balance in life is one of those series, but an acknowledgement of that, you know, Bethany brought that notion to um, Alan Rasmussen and I, and, and we started um, the Building Resilience series. So Bethany, if you want to share where we are with that and, and any other thoughts around the Building Resilience series. Sure. Um, yeah. So we've, we completed, it was supposed to just be a six month series and, and um, it was so impactful on every single person that was in that group that we have decided to continue meeting monthly. Um, everyone for the most part, wanted to share their, their email or their phone to stay in touch outside of those sessions because we had built a community similar to Balancing Life um, on Fridays where it, the, today's a perfect example, right? When you started, Crystal, how many people in the chat were like, oh, me too, or thank goodness, I thought it was just me. It's, it's that um, having that space to just own it and talk about it, like you said, like the quote says, and it, it's automatically kind of just releases some of that stress and 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 you feel less guilty for for having those um emotions or that fatigue that it's like oh okay there's an actual reason behind this somebody was saying oh it's not just because i'm old and 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 yeah rightfully so you know there there are actual biological and psychological things that are happening that are causing all of these different um, emotions and feelings and, and, and the physicality of, of the stress that's taken its toll. And it's, it's just reassuring to know that in and of itself. But, you know, I think if, if nothing else, the, what Alan would say is use that, right? Use the pain or the struggle or the stress that you've been through to push forward and apply it and do better the next time. So like when all of a sudden the pipeline goes down and you can't get gas, you're like, okay, we've been through worse. It's going to be all right this week. Right. So, so you taking that resilience 
what you've pushed through, applying it, moving forward. And then, and so this resilient series has helped um, others to acknowledge and embrace that and then apply it in their personal and professional lives. And so we are very much hoping to do another cohort of that. And what I'm going to do is just put my email in the chat box. We're going to try it this way. And Krista will put it out in an email as well. But if you are interested, we're thinking, Alan, Crystal, and myself, of starting another cohort of about 35, like we did before, because the smaller group setting engages and is interactive. If you're interested, email me. I'm going to drop my email in the chat. Um, there are many of the original cohort that are on this session today. Y'all can chime in and, and encourage your fellow balancing lifers. Um, but it's, it's been a great space. Um, it's a space that not everyone has the luxury of just venting and expressing how they're feeling because they've got to stay so in, in charge of their professional and personal lives. So um, I will put my email in the box and then Crystal will send that out in, in the, the email after this session as well. Thanks, Crystal. Yes, thank you. And Bethany and I have been participants. So Alan is the coach and he gives us guidance and redirection and support and all the things that we are grappling with. So we do have that space available and appreciate that. Um, and very real, very candid, the, the issue with the gas that if you're in Virginia or North Carolina, you know about this space. The speaker today was slated to be Dr. Kim Allen, who's at NC State. But without going into a lot of detail, the gas shortage precluded her from being able to show up. So Herman just got the link to the video from me this morning because I just pulled this presentation together this morning. Thank you, gas shortage, but that's where we are. So hopefully it's been useful and helpful to each of you because I really wanted us to talk about this and we will have Dr. Allen on later. She is amazing and we'll look forward to having her on. The next two weeks, we're gonna continue with the space of mental health. And so um, the next two weeks we have Chesterfield Mental Health folks coming on to talk to us one week focused on um, mental health and adults and the next week, mental health and youth. I may have those flip flop, but you'll get those in the email as well. So as we wrap up um, for today, I always like to put something out there as an encouragement uh, from the session to do over the weekend. So over this weekend, I'm going to encourage you to, if you didn't have answers to those, how well do you know you questions, spend some time with those and spend some time thinking about, you know, how you would answer and what you would do um, in some of those, whether it's hobby or something else in the space of taking care of you. So having said that, I'm going to say thank you, Dawn, because I called Dawn yesterday too and said, be on alert. I may need you in the morning. And she showed up. Great team. Herman and Bethany, thank you as always. And for those of you who are here, have a fantastic weekend and we will see you next week. Same time, same place, talking about mental health. Take care, all. Bye. Bye. Bye.